Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Fiona Davis, who is our first repeat guest. And I love that, that we've been doing this long enough that we have a repeat guest. And we're going to be talking about her latest historical fiction novel, The Lions of Fifth Avenue. Now, Fiona's four novels prior to this were all bets on selections, and this one is going to be one as well. So let me just tell you, I am in love with her work. And I know that many of you are as well. So I am just looking forward to this. Thank you so much for joining us today, Fiona. Oh, my pleasure. I'm honored to be the first repeat guest. That's fantastic. First repeat guest, yeah. So what inspired you to write about the New York Public Library? Yeah, you know, each building in my book, because they're all set in landmark New York City buildings, has come about a different way. And this one was interesting because it really came from the reader's suggestions. I have been doing author talks around the country, and at every talk, people love to throw out their favorite buildings. And the New York Public Library came up over and over and over to the point where I thought, okay, I have to at least take a look. You know, I'm not sure if I can set a story there you know, how much is going on in a library? You know, can I make a plot out of that? And I'm so glad I listened to them. And then the first thing that you found was that there was an apartment in the building, which I knew nothing about. I mean, I've been to the library, you know, umpteen times for events and things through the years. So there was a seven room apartment there, which just think about how coveted that is in New York right now. I know, imagine what that rent would be right now. <laughs> I know, imagine, right, on Fifth <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, so early in my research, I was looking at old articles in the New York Times and one came up talking about how the, the superintendent was retiring after having lived in the library for 30 years and, and in the seven room apartment. And it talked about how he raised his children there. His daughter was born in the library, um, that the kids used to get in trouble for playing baseball using books as bases. <laughs> after hours. I mean, there was so much material there. And once I learned that, yes, a family lived in the library for 30 years, I thought, well, that, that's amazing. I can, I can put a fictional family in there and then play with the mystery element and play with the plot and create a story that really inspires me. So they lived there for, so it was one family over those years or there were families in and out? One family. Yeah. His name was John Fiedler. And he had three children and a wife. And, and, um, and, and yeah, they were there for, for 30 years. The son went on to become the chief engineer at the library, which is kind of cool. Oh, cool. And, and now, of course, I, I was able to get a wonderful behind the scenes tour of the apartment, thanks to the, the people at the New York Public Library. And it is now offices and storage space, but I could still get a really great sense of it because it's, it's kind of on the southern courtyard and, and on a right angle along two sides of it. And so you could see these enormous windows in the bedrooms that looked out onto the courtyard and you could kind of tell where the kitchen and, and the dining room was. It was, it was amazing. Were they there from the beginning? Like from, was the apartment was, okay, there were people there yeah. right from the beginning. In fact, even before it opened, I think they moved in a year or two before it opened because the construction was going on and he was in charge of everything. He really ran the infrastructure of the whole building. It was a huge job. He had, I think, 90 employees. And so they were there actually before it opened in 1911. Wow. Well, so you created this fictitious family that starts in 1913. What, what made you pick that year? You know, I wanted to get something that was near to the start of the library for when it opened in 1911, because that's kind of an interesting time period. Um, you know, the building is, is new. Everybody's excited about it. So I wanted to get something close to the opening date of 1911. And then I learned in doing research that the Columbia Journalism School opened in 1912. Hmm. And that started me thinking, wow, what if, you know, what was it like for a woman, because it was co-ed, to go to the Columbia Journalism School? And of course, I went there in 2000, much later. But I thought that could be really fun to draw on. And so once I learned that, 1913 felt like the right date. And it was the time when the new woman was going on. And that was the idea that women maybe could look at roles other than the traditional ones of being a wife and mother. And women were talking about the right to vote and, and women's rights. And, and there was a lot going on in the city at that time. So it felt like a good bubbly period to play with. It was also, I was thinking about this before World War I. So the city was, the, the whole country was in a very different place. So people were moving around differently. If you'd said it much later, you would have had to deal with either one of the wars, like either that or the Roaring Twenties or something like that. It was just, it's that moment before everything started to happen. But when you think about that time in history as well, 
you're thinking how different the world was and how much smaller everything was at the same time. Yeah, it's true. And, and I also love that I hadn't written in the 1910s before. I'd done, I'd covered the 1920s in the masterpiece. Right. And so the 1910s for me were a new period where I could explore new political things that were going on and, and social unrest. And, and so that, that's kind of what guided me into pinpointing 1913. Thanks. And then how about the 1993 time frame? That's one you know better. Yeah, yes, luckily I was in the city then, so that's a bit of a cheat. Um, but yeah, you know, I decided to do that time period because I want, there's a major book theft in the book that kind of spans both decades. And I wanted to be able to, to draw on an actual book theft that occurred at Columbia University again um, at their Butler Library in 1994. And because of that, I needed the de technology and the setup to, to take place around then. Also because back then, book thefts from libraries, it, it wasn't considered a huge crime. Um, and, and that book theft was, was kind of monumental in people treating rare books and manuscripts and the theft of them as a real travesty. And so it, it was a turning point, really, in, in the legal aspects of, of rare books and book thefts. And so that that felt right, and I hadn't I hadn't worked in that one either in the '90s. So again, it was something new to play with, new to play with, new to do. You know, it was interesting because um, I didn't realize I never thought about book thefts at the library. I never thought about this becoming such a big deal, and I also didn't think about that the books are actually marked. I think it was what page seventy-two was it? Page seventy-two that they put yeah. a mark on, so the book was stolen. You'd be able to see this was a stolen book. I found that fascinating, but it was also the stress that people went through to should they deface the book because it's so precious to be able to do that. So is that really something that happens? Is the books are marked? Um, yeah, and this was what was going on, um, you know, in the 1910s. There's some wonderful um, books about book thefts from that time period that I read and, and so I could get to know. And what's interesting about the New York Public Library is it's not a circulating library. It's not a lending library. Anything you want to look at, you have to stay inside the building to look at it. It's a research library. You can't take a book out. And, and, so, and so you have, you know, the general books that everybody loves to read. And then you have these special collections of rare books. And so part of the 1990s section takes place at the Burr Collection, which is a, a library within a library. And it's only rare books and manuscripts and ephemera from, from famous authors. And so that's where you have to really protect them. Um, and that's where it, the question of do you mark it so that it shows that this is from the library in case someone does steal it so it can be identified. Or because it's so rare, say a draft of a Walt Whitman poem or a Virginia Woolf diary, you know, should you not do that because they are so valuable and so fragile and delicate. Interesting. Yeah, I had never thought about that they would mark the books. I never thought about book theft being, I mean, I thought books, th theft of modern books. I've been in a number of um, archival libraries around the country. There's one in Minneapolis, all well, children's manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And you go in, you put on your special gloves, to, you know, go look at everything. And I couldn't picture people, you know, being able to take something out because you're being watched like hawks and things like that. And then to read the line about people using Dentafloss to be able to get the book pages out that they wanted or whatever, I felt like I was watching some kind of a crime, like a crime movie or something like that. If this is what people did. Yeah, there was a very famous map thief who um, was a, a real scholar and really respected in the in kind of that circle, that world of rare books. And he would get to know the librarians and, and so they became comfortable with him. And so they might turn their back. You know, they thought, oh, you know, this guy, he won't, he can't. We know him, he's, he's a real scholar. He would never deface these books. And he would go in and, and use a razor or dental floss to, to tear out a map wow. from an atlas, from an ancient atlas and fold it up and sneak it out. And, and that one piece of paper was so valuable for him, it was worth the risk. Wow. Wow. I remember when I was at that one library, Kate Camillo. I was looking for her notes from her books and she had her shopping list written down the side and a bunch of phone numbers <laughs> because it was really all her, you know, a, a collection of her writings through the years and her writings included the food shopping list. It was really pretty funny. So when uh, Laura, your candidate, your uh, character from the 1913 attends the Columbia School of Journalism, it was so interesting to read about women there and 
look, I was at Fordham for communications in the 70s, and it was still like women doing that was a big deal. I mean, it was, we would still go downtown and it was mostly guys in the class. I have to say when we go down on reporting and whatever, but she was one of very few people. I didn't even know they were admitting women at that point. So a lot of women or? It was 15% women in those early days. And, and yeah, like you said, I mean, it was the prevailing sexism, sexism at the time also pertained to the J school. They, it's not like they escaped it. And so the women were treated very differently. If the men were sent down to cover murders or politics, the women were sent to orphanages to cover crying children. And, and so Laura in that section gets kind of worked up about the injustice of it and starts trying to write the stories that she feels are important. And she really clashes with, the, with some of the professors there. Now, I have to say my experience was very different. I loved every minute at the Columbia Journalism School and it really changed my life. It taught me how to write and think and how to shape a story. And these days, um, believe it or not, um, it is now 75% women. Wow. So things wow. have changed. Big change. Well, you know, we were down, we had to do a writing assignment when we were as freshmen, right? And they sent us all down to City Hall to cover you know, like what was happening for the day. And bonus points, if you got a quote from A. Bean at the time, was the mayor, right? Oh, yeah, sure. So I'm down with a whole group of guys from my class, you know, taking the subway down, blah, blah, blah. It's the 70s in New York. And all of a sudden I said, I'm going to run to the ladies' room. And I run into A. Bean and I get the quote. Right? And I come back and I said, okay, I got the quote. And they're like, how did you do that? Like you left the room. How did you do that? And I said, I have to go to the ladies' room in order to get the quote, guys. I said, that's where it ends up happening. It was so funny because I literally walked out and saw him. So that was the joke for the rest of the year because it's like, well, maybe we should follow her around because she's going to find. And it was still that going to get the scoop, which is so different in journalism today. I mean, so, so many times you get something that might happen maybe as the story that's out there, whereas this was like real reporting of people going in to try to get in depth, what was happening? Get the you know the point of view, you know, blah blah blah. And when you're sitting there reading, where she's writing about these very you know big topics, they're topics that women weren't even supposed to think about at this point, let alone be writing and sharing with others. That was my takeaway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 so she has to do what you did of of go around and try and come at a story from a different angle so that she can still cover it, even if it's not a, a woman's story. Um, so that's amazing, you know, that you're able to outwit everybody. I love it. And it was really funny. I remember my, my first day at journalism school, they, we thought, okay, you know, you're there, you're going to learn, you know, they'll ease us in. And the first day they said, all right, here's a story assignment, go out and interview people on the street. And you were, you were just terrified because the thought of walking up to a stranger and asking them a question just seemed incomprehensible. And I have to say, I'm so glad I did that because now when I research books, I'm always out talking to real people and interviewing experts. And part of me, part of the fun is for me to go out and, and you know, talk one-on-one -on -one or virtually with an expert at whatever I'm trying to write about. And it's definitely, I think, helps deepen the plot and the story. And I think that them saying in their own words, the, their inflection, what mattered to them, where they heard about the research, and all those little anecdotes along the way are what make the story so interesting. And I think it's something that we're, it's hard to do during these times because it's hard to just have those on, off the cuff conversations. Like everything feels so scripted these days of we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And it's not that you were walking to the ladies room together while you were in the place or you bumped into each other in the hallway and you had a conversation. It's all very thought through ahead of time right now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's packaged. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a good way of putting it. That's really, really good. So for, there was also a book row, which is where people used to go down and sell these used books. They would go down and whatever they'd stolen or whatever. And it was very well known that that might be the place that people would go to sell and your character goes down there to help investigate what's going on. Where was Book Row? Yeah, so Book Row was on 4th Avenue, just below Union Square. And I think there were about 80 bookstores there at the height of its time. And now, of course, there's only one, The Strand, that's left over. It's around the corner on Broadway. Um, but it was a huge place for booksellers and book buyers in New York for, for a long time, for about 80 years. Um, and yeah, it's sad that it's gone now. And there's still a lot of rare book um, stores around New York, but they're, they're scattered about. Right. 
Yeah, and it, I think that that's what people don't understand too is how different the book culture used to be in the city and how vibrant it was. And like if there were 80 bookstores in that area of people being able to just walk in and out and go look at books, whereas we're now used to either big stores or they're little tiny places along the way. And it's just much so much more difficult to have that kind of use, um, that experience of just traveling around into a store. Not everybody had everything. Some people had some things and others were other. It was a very, very interesting time when you think back on it. Yeah, it's true. And I'm so happy to see indie bookstores are surviving even in this crazy time. And, and I have to say, just going into an indie bookstore and getting a, a recommendation from a bookseller who understands if you like this book, you might like another, you know, who really gets what a, an avid reader is like is just so heartening. So hopefully they will keep on, keep on doing well. And I think that they also were able to pivot because they're small and come up with what do we really need right now? What do we really need to do? And I think that that's, you know, you didn't have to make 14 corporate decisions. It was walk around with your staff and say, should we be doing events on Zoom? Should we be doing this? What, what do we need right now? What are our customers looking for us instead of this amorphous, I have no idea who these people are. They knew them by name. And I think that makes a big difference. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's been incredible. The way they've connected authors and readers over mm -hmm. Zoom has been phenomenal. Yeah, something really, really interesting to watch. So for those who haven't been able to go to the library, we've got some slides that you can walk us through of sharing the outside and some of the rooms. So um, let me see if we can get those queued up. We're going to start with the outside of the library. I believe it's when it was, is this 1908? 1908, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so th there she is. She's a beauty. It, when she was built, um, it opened in 1911. Um, it, it was the largest marble building in America, which you can imagine. And it took nine years and $9 million to build. And when it opened on its first day, it had 1 million books inside and 50,000 people visited the very first day. Wow. Wow. And here you can see they haven't planted anything around it. It's still under construction. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's just that beautiful building on the corner that you're you know, so used to seeing now. I also don't see any lions on the front steps. When did they come in? They came in. They were there by the time it opened in 1911. You can see the pedestals for them. Right. Um, but yeah, so when they, they were first there, they were named Leo Lennox and Leo Astor after the found, two of the founders of the library. And it wasn't only until the Depression, um, after the Depression, that they were renamed Patience and Fortitude, which is what they're known for now, after Depression era virtues. And these days, if you walk by them, they're wearing three foot wide masks and, and social distancing. So that's nice. <laughs> I love that. Like if the lions can do it, anyone can do it. If the lions can wear their masks and leave them on all day long. I saw pictures of that and I thought it was such, so charming. That was, you know, that was what ended up happening. And, you know, the library is so interesting because um, I think we're in a flash. I think the next slide is where the apartment was in the building. I think we've got that one next. Let's see. And I don't know where quite, what side of the building was it on? Was it on the right? Um, it was on the left. So as you're facing it, this is the left side. It's the south end of it. And it's, it's a mezzanine level. So it's not on the first, second, or third floors. It's its own level. It's mezzanine just above the first floor. And to get to it, you would go along a hallway on the first floor and make a right and then another right. And there's a kind of a secret stairway that leads up to the very corner of it there. And that's where you enter. And it overlooks, like I said, the, the courtyard there. And the bedrooms all go up and down um, M1 to M4. And then on the other end is the, the living area. But it was a, a nice location, but really embedded deep inside the library. Yeah, I can see that, you can see that. But I think it would be, I wish they had still had it there like the Campbell apartment, the, like it's still over in Grand Central. I wish you could actually just go up and see what this was like. And it was usable space still for, um, not for an apartment, but be able to, you know, go up and tour it because I just think it's such an interesting detail that was part of the library for 30 years. I mean, yeah, that's people, a long time. People love it. People love that idea. And there are other libraries all around New York that have apartments that were inside because back then the boiler needed to be tended to. And so, um, in fact, um, there's a woman named Sharon Washington who wrote a one woman show called Feeding the Dragon about growing up in an Upper West Side library with her family where her father was superintendent. And that's a wonderful audio to listen to, to get a sense of someone who actually grew up in a library. Yeah, grew up in the library, I could picture, you know, but it was a big cathedral that was built down in Newark when my parents were growing up. 
and they actually ran out of money or it, something. I think it was during the war. And my father was playing baseball in there when he was a little kid. And he says, here we are at Sacred Heart Cathedral. He says, but I remember playing baseball inside the cathedral and, you know, hanging out with my friends. So when this was being built, you'd love to know all those little stories of people sneaking in at night and all those kind of things, because it was nowhere near the security that we have now. So that would be so much fun to just to see what did go on while the building was happening. Yes. A huge building. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it took a long time to build. It took forever. Yeah. And next, I think we've got a picture of the Rose Reading Room, which I believe I was there shortly after it was redone with those beautiful um, lamps coming down. I don't remember. Do you remember what year that was refurbished? Um, oh, you know, I don't remember. I don't have that off the top of my head. But yeah, they did a major, major renovation. And what's amazing about this is it's up on the third floor. So it's up on the very top of the library. And um, the, the, the architects were Carrera and Hastings. And they designed not only the building and the, the, you know, the structure, but even all the details inside, including the lamps and the desks, which are intricately carved. If you can, you know, if you go in there and look at them from the side, they're beautifully carved. And even the waste paper baskets were designed by the architects. And because of that, the building really feels like a cohesive whole. Well, it was interesting because uh, when I was in there, they had just recently renovated and they needed to put in Wi-Fi connections, places for you to plug in which they didn't have before. So all the desks had to be refurbished and they want to make sure they still look sleek and whatever. But that was a huge um, stumbling block at the time was to how to make it all like, you know, work within the fr framework and still make it look as um, sleek and wonderful as it is. Right. How do you update an old building like this? That's a, it's so difficult, but I think they did a great job. Yeah, they really did. It was wonderful. Um, next, I think we've got a picture of the stacks. And the stacks, I actually got to go down into the stacks. And I think that people are, I'll let you talk about it, but it's absolutely fascinating that this is really under like where Brian Park is. So if you could just share like what happens in here. This is not the stacks that are under Bryant Park. That's oh, a separate, aren't. yeah, that's um, under Bryant Park in 1992, I believe is when they opened, they, they dug in under the park, which is behind the library. And they put two layers of storage down there. And so that's the stacks that are under Bryant Park. This is directly under the Rose main reading room, which is what we just saw earlier. And so the Rose reading room is at the very top there. And what you do if you want a book is you go to the card catalog and you would fill out a, a, a slip and it would go down by pneumatic tube back in the old days, um, all the way down to the stacks. And it, the pages would get the, the call slip and there are the pages running around grabbing the books. It's seven layers of, of bookshelves underneath the reading room. And um, then they get the books back up on kind of like a trolley system that was like a, a Ferris wheel. And then there was of course a denim waiter for oversized books. And that was the system. And what's amazing is that's the system that's still in place today pretty much other than now instead of the pneumatic tube that is computerized. But the pneumatic tubes are still there and, and gleaming. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating because you think that, oh, I'm in the floor and then you realize what's all been built down below. It's like the catacombs underneath. Yes, exactly. Anyhow, I just think it's, the, and we were actually, we did this tour running up and down those steps, which are like narrow and steep. And then we did go out um, underneath the other parts as well to see. And it's just fascinating because you just see this one stunning building and then you realize how much is housed there that we don't know anything about. Yes, exactly. It's like this crazy beehive of books. Yeah. It's like hidden inside. I think, I think then we have, um, let's talk for just for a second first about the Berg collection. What is actually the Berg collection? Yeah, so the Berg collection um, was, here's the room um, where the scholars come to, to work. It, it's on the third floor and it was um, started by the Berg brothers. They donated their book collection in the late forties. And it contains um, manuscripts and rare books and ephemera of uh, almost 400 authors like Nabokov or Tennyson. Walt Whitman. And it also has really interesting quirky items um, like Charles Dickens' cat paw letter opener, which has the paw of his beloved cat Bob on it, which is weird, but typical of that time. Um, and then you have Virginia Woolf's walking stick that she left by the side of the river before she killed herself. You have a lock of Walt Whitman's hair. You have Jack Kerouac's boots, um, Charlotte Bronte's writing desk. Um, but the main part are all these these documents and letters and and you know Virginia Woolf's diaries or a draft of a Walt Whitman poem, and they really show us 
the act of human creation. Mm -hmm. And so you see drafts with words crossed out or you know, a, a, a tear where maybe the author was frustrated. And you can really get a sense that these authors who we revere were human and that they created these masters, masterful documents and books and poems over a process of elimination and, and frustration. And so it's a really wonderful record of how, how these poems and, and books came about. And, and is, it's only open for scholars. You can't just walk in. You have to apply to get in and show that you're doing research. Um, but it's just a, it was just a wonderful place to set my 1990s part of the book where Sadie is a curator and she's putting together a, a big exhibit of rare books and one goes missing. And so I always imagined her working away in here whenever I was writing. Now, were you, you were able to work in the library for, because you were doing research. Did you work in a room like this or where were you in, were you in the Rose Room or where were you? There's a room called the Allen Room. Um, and that is for authors with book contracts. And it's, it's a smallish room, it's about that size, and there's a number of desks and cubicles, basically. But what's amazing about it is if you're there, you can ask for books, you can request books on, to do with whatever you're working on, and they get delivered right to your bookshelf. Oh my, wow. And so you show up in a couple of days and there's a book on typhoid or you know, a huge book on the construction of the library. And that was very helpful, and there's just nothing like working on a book about the library in the library. I, every time I walked in, I, it, my breath was taken away. <laughs> yeah, no, it felt like it's a completely lucky moment, just a completely, you know, surreptitious kind of thing to just be there and saying, I am in the place I am writing about. And there's so much history there. So actually people cannot go in and take books out of this library. Can people go in and tour any part of it? Or how do you even get into this library? Oh, you can walk in. It's open to the public. Um, and in fact, they have wonderful tours, I think, every hour when it's open. Um, <laughs> and, and they'll take you in and, and show you all the, you know, you can walk down the halls and get into the Rose Reading Room. And um, there's a catalog room that's beautiful. There's a number of wonderful rooms for maps, um, for genealogy. And you can wander around and go into any room. You just can't take the books out with you. Um, but, but yeah, it's a great space and it's, it's usually, it's full of tourists and just a really happening spot. Yeah. It, it, and that gives such a flavor to the place as well, I'm sure, because it's not just people who are New Yorkers. It's people who are just coming to see this fabulous place. And for anybody, any of our listeners, if you haven't had a chance to see it when you're in the city, it's definitely a stop. You know, people always say we're going to Empire State Building. We're going to XYZ. This is just something that you really want to see and be inside if you can, you know? Yes, oh, I absolutely agree. You know, there's a moment that something happens with Jack's manuscript mm -hmm. that I'm not going to share. I'm not going to give it away. But it did make me realize how writers today will have a, a copy of their manuscript someplace. So what's your usual backup at the end of the day kind of technique? Do you back up to the cloud? What do you usually do? Yeah, so I, um, I work in a program called Scrivener, which is a great program for writing historical fiction because you can access all your research very, very easily. But um, once a week, I back up to an external hard drive. And then every so often, I email myself the manuscript. Mm -hmm. and, and because as, I, as I'm kind of shaping out a chapter, I write on a notebook with a pencil first, just the general idea of what's going to go in the chapter or the scene. I always have those as a backup as well. So if you know everything was lost, I would be able to hopefully piece of book together using my notebooks. But, but it's, it's so fraught, it, the electronic way of doing things. It really is, because something can go wrong at any time. Anytime, anytime. It, it, somebody could be, oh, my hard drive crashed, this is the other thing. And I remember when we were first starting the company, which is 24 years ago now, things did, and like, you know, things did cut out in the middle. And their, you know, the computer would decide to reboot itself and just be there, I just lost everything I've been working on for the last how many hours. And now there are so many different ways that you can do this. Well, in reading that part, I was thinking about how different it was for authors in those days of when you were writing. When you sent the manuscript out, you literally sent the manuscript out. It's not like there was the backup copy someplace of what was going on. And you think about now how people will send out a book, it'll be on multiple submissions, either to an agent or to a publisher. And we think things move slowly now. Can you just imagine those times where you sent it out where? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And can you imagine you get it back with, you know, edits? 
and then you have to retype the entire thing right. including the edits and and do that multiple times like retyping you know war and peace over and over and over <laughs> over and over. And I think that when you, when these are the details that you put into a book, these little things are slid in there that just make you realize what the times were actually like and how we always see things through our lens and how you really do such a great job of giving us different lenses to look back through and saying, well, wait a second, strip out all these other things you know. And you're doing that for 1993, which was also a far, far enough ago that things were very different. And yet you have to pull back still on technology that we have now that there was cutting edge, maybe. Yeah, and, and I don't mind doing that because in a way, not having a cell phone makes it easier for characters to miscommunicate mm -hmm. or, or have missed connections. And that helps the plot. So I prefer to stay away from anything too modern because in a way you can solve the mystery much quicker. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. It, it is really true because you, you realize, well, well, why didn't you don't you just do that? Why didn't you just text them? Why didn't you just whatever? And I'm hearing more and more from authors that they want to set it back a little bit in time so you don't have those devices of what to be able to do. Because honestly, sometimes if you can't find somebody in 24 hours right now, what are you doing wrong <laughs> that you can't figure it out? Like, where is the book? You could just call a bunch of people, but you realize at that time, you couldn't even do that. You couldn't even call around to the bookshops. You couldn't even... Right. Everything was very different. Yeah, yeah, you had to go in person and hope for the best. Right. And also, we think of the subway now. We think the subway now is slow. I mean, just picture what it was like back then and the streetcars and, you know, what was going on. It was just such a very, very different place. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, I like the way you not only set your books in a different time period, but you fully develop the characters. Like, you're, you're totally, you know, um, into giving them every, you know, system, uh, aspect of themselves. Which one was the easiest to write in this book? Was there one easier? Um, well, that's such a good question. Probably Laura was a little easier, even though she's back in 1913. Um, her, her need to kind of figure herself out and find her way really resonated with me. I think I went through the same thing in my, you know, 30s and 40s. She's, in, she's 29, but I'm just trying to figure out what is your purpose in the world and what should you be doing as a career and what will make you happy. And so that, that, that was fun to take her on that ride, definitely. And was there somebody more challenging? Yeah, I would say Sadie um, in 1990s because she's a curator at the library and she's a prickly person, mm. you know? She's not really good with other people. Um, and so to make her a little curmudgeonly but still lovable, was a, a tricky dance to do and I had to make sure I wasn't pushing her too far because I my tendency is to make them really unlikable um, and then I have to pull back a little and you know soften her edges. Well speaking of softening her edges at one point she's doing swing dancing outside of Lincoln Center and I've actually seen people do this I have a friend who used to go swing dancing outside Lincoln Center it's one of the things the pandemic is not allowing to have happened this summer yeah. so have you ever done this or have you just watched people do it? Oh, I've watched it every summer. I love to go and just watch. It's it's called um, Lincoln Center Swing or Summer Swing. Summer Swing. I think it's Summer, summer swing. swing. And it's out on the the terrace of the the Lincoln Center, and and people dress up, and you know the best dancers in New York come out and dance, and and the worst dancers too, and it's perfectly okay. And I love watching it. I think it's great. And they bring in live bands. Yeah, so it was fun to to recreate that, especially now where. You know, I miss so much that energy of New York of stumbling into something going on that's interesting and creative. And usually if you walk 10 blocks, something was going to happen. Somebody <laughs> was going to be doing something that you were going to be excited about. But this one, it's also, she's so in a box and it's like he swings her in, to, it swings her into the setup and all of a sudden you see a different side of her. And it was just, I felt like that's that moment where you do something different with the character, literally, of just swinging them into a different direction. And it, it was one where you saw another side of, like, who could she be? Because we've only thought of her one way all this time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad. That's, that was my hope with that scene. So I'm very yeah. glad. It totally, totally, totally worked. So the title, The Lions of the Avenue, it seems like it was a natural. Was that always the title? No, it was called the New York Public Library Project, which is all I, that's all I do. I'm terrible at titles. All my ideas are basically laughable. 
And so it's always, it, my agent has been the one to come up with pretty much every title. This one, my agent and my editor had the same idea at the same time. And the minute they said it, I thought, oh, that's perfect. And after that, I changed the last name of the Laura character to Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S. So the title refers to both the, the Lyons outside the library, as well as the family living deep inside. And I like that, that echo. It's def okay, now I missed that. So that was that was really good. I'm glad we're hearing that because I, that one went completely beyond, <laughs> beyond me. So how about the cover? Was that, did you work a lot on the cover or was it one that also, like you knew you had to have the building. You knew you had to have that. You know, I, I wanted to make sure it was a black and white background because um, the, the two first books, the dollhouse and the address had a black and white building in the background. And I just thought that was so effective. And so I, that's the only thing I kind of suggested and said, you know, and a woman in, in a dress reading a book, maybe. And, and they came up with that, and it was just perfect. I, we fiddled a little with the colors, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was it. I, I thought it was just perfect, and, and I think it reads well, and it gives a sense of what the book is about, and a sense of that it is historical fiction. And I just love that pop of yellow on the cover. I did. I like the pop of yellow too. It's like the pop of green that was on the uh, the book of Grand Central. Remind me of the title. Yeah, um, the masterpiece. <laughs> the ma <laughs> Duh, Carol, Thank you. The yes, but it's like those little things that just pop, and it's because you're making sure you know it's about a woman at the same time, or it's about women in, in this particular case. And I think that that just makes a big sense, a big, big, big uh, good idea. And I just love, I know, even the way the blue is done, I just think the whole cover completely works. Oh, good. I'll pass that on. They'll be pleased to hear that. Yeah. But also then your, your, your name in pink. I found that interesting too. It was like, okay, let's let that pop as well. Yeah. And you know what? That was my agent's idea. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because you wouldn't think that would all work and somehow it does, which I love. It's, well, this it's is unexpected. Sounds terribly sexist, but by the same token... I'm sitting there thinking of the lines at the avenue. You always think men. So here you're seeing a woman and your name being in pink. I think it's all subtle, but I think it all works. You know? right. So right. being terribly sexist, <laughs> taught me around. But you know what? I'm seeing that too, completely too. I'll take it. So your book is the Good Morning America book club selection for this month, which is uh, super exciting. Now, how long ago did you know that this was happening? We found out about a month before it aired and, and we were told you have to keep it a secret. You can't tell anyone, which was terrifying. Um, and, uh, and I was just so excited. And then they announced it on the show on August 4th, which was the same day the book came out. And it was just amazing. The, the response from other authors has been so lovely and readers and, you know, this is the fifth book. And so by now there's a, a really wonderful readership behind mm -hmm. my books. And just to be able to share that with them was, was really exciting. Well, we recently did a poll on the site and we asked people which book they were most excited about reading and yours was at the top. I and that really it. shows something of really how you've built an audience over five books. And I've been at a number of events that you've done and there's such a huge crowd that have read everything. And they actually quote chapter and verse about everything and the characters, whatever. And I find that to be so interesting in a world right now where everything is five minutes, like five seconds, mm -hmm. that um, I think that you've really resonated with a very strong group of people with bringing, um, I think it's a surprise of like, what are you going to write about? And then how you handle the material as well. It's very, very interesting. Oh, thank you. I, I think it's fun too, because readers know to expect that they'll get a behind the scenes view of a famous building that they might otherwise not know everything about. Um, but then each book is standalone. You know, it doesn't matter what order you read them in. It's, they're all completely different stories. So it's a, a mix of familiar and, and something new. Yeah, and I think that also, you know, we're, you're seeing the familiar, you're seeing whatever, but you also know you're gonna have women characters that you're really going to come to know. And though I couldn't quote you their names from each of the books, I can quote you things about each of them. I'm terrible with names, but to be able to say like, oh, I remember what happened at the Dakota. Oh, I remember what happened at the Barbizon. And there are little things, there are little details about the people, the characters, I remember as much as I do the buildings themselves. Oh, so it's a treat. Thank you. That's what every author wants to hear. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> both. It's both. So now what are you going to do for the book club? I know you'll be doing it virtually, but are you going to be discussing the book with them on air or do you know? Yeah, we just did an interview that was taped um, over Zoom and we talked for an hour about the book and different aspects of the book and that will air on um, Thursday, this Thursday, which 
I don't know what, when this is airing, but it will be, and, and it'll be on my, my Facebook page and everywhere else after. Um, and so that'll be fun to kind of, it, it's more of a behind the scenes look and, and some of the images from the research and, and what the whole book, what went into making the book. And what we'll do is we'll put it in the show notes for both the podcast and the video. So we'll make sure we have that link. As soon as we have it available, we'll make sure that people have that so they can go out and watch that full bore interview as well. So it, I think it's really exciting because so many book clubs have read your book. I know that's books. I know that so many people have connected and they connect really quickly too. Like they're ready to talk about the new book. I know one group in our town is going to be talking about it this month. And I love that people are so prepped and ready to talk about your work. When people um, can connect with you, I take it via your website if they want to talk to you, if they want to do oh, that. Yeah. yeah, through my website, which is fionadavis.net. And I'm on Facebook as Fiona Davis author and Instagram as Fiona J. Davis. And, and you know, I, I'm pretty active there. So it's um, sending out details about new events that are coming up or research tidbits about what went on behind that and, and just connecting with readers. So yeah, please, anyone can reach out at any time. Well, you know, in preparation for this, I was listening to a number of different interviews with you. And it was interesting that no two were the same. Like you, there are always different things that are brought up. So I just love that because so many people, it's like a canned speech, but for you, it's you're constantly bringing something different to the conversation. I mean, I've actually interviewed you a number of times about the same book and we've always gone in different directions. So it's, it's really, really fun for our readers to be able to do that. Also, I'm going to share with readers, if you get in touch with Fiona, here's the one thing I'm going to tell you to do is tell her what time zone you live in and tell her what day and of the week and what time you want to meet with her. Because too many people just say, we'd like you to talk to our book group and it requires so many notes going back and forth, but let's help her out a little bit. Tell her what book too. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> it's also which book, because it's like, wait a second, which one do you want to talk about? And you can say something like the one that takes place in the library, if you don't know the title, and you can say the art one, you can do that. It's really okay. But just give her some kind of direction of what's going on, because she now has five books. So which one do you want to be discussing? So with that in mind, what's next for you? Where are we going next with you? Yeah, so the next book, which I'm working on now, takes place at the Frick Collection. And that is a, a beautiful museum on Fifth Avenue and 70th Street. And it was the home of Henry Clay Frick and his family. And then after his wife died, it was left to the city and became this beautiful art museum. And so I love the fact that it was a, you know, a residence and also a museum. So that gives me two interesting eras to, to play with. And uh, yeah, working on it now I'm, and fingers crossed it, it, it gets done and goes well. You know, every, every book it's as if I've never written one ever. Mm -hmm. And so every book is just this learning curve about the time and the characters and putting a mystery plot together and making it work. And I'm just always surprised, you know, when I remember working on Lions and thinking, I can't possibly make this work, it's impossible. Yeah. And then it, it's, a, it's a nice reminder to be working on a first draft while you're promoting the last book, because it's a remind, reminder that yes, you can do it, just keep on. <laughs> yes, I'm very humble about my own work, but wait, I did do it once or twice or five times. You know, I've probably really been able to do this before. It's not a problem. <laughs> you know? Well, it's so interesting because you've taken us to so many different places in the city that, especially with people not being able to get out right now, basically you could do five, five tours of New York with what you're doing. Is your research different this time because you're not boots on the ground as much? You know, I was very lucky in that I started doing the heavy research in January and February. So I, I got a lot of interviews and boots on the ground research in the Frick um, itself, which was helpful, and a behind the scenes tour of the building, which was great. And luckily for me, the Frick online has basically a virtual floor plan. So I can walk into any room and look around and get different views. So it's almost like I'm there. And wow. thank goodness, because otherwise it, it would be much harder working from photographs. Their website, frick.org, is so interactive and they do really fun things like every Friday, they have cocktails with a curator where a curator talks about one of the works that's, that's uh, on the walls. And it's, so I highly recommend checking them out. It's a great place. You know, and so many people are talking about being able to do things virtually right now. 
I mean, you basically could be busy every night of the week. I know there are many times where I, my husband says, well, we want to have dinner. I said, well, I have something at six. I have something at 7.30. I have something at eight. And there was a time a couple of weeks ago that I was watching two things simultaneously. So <laughs> one was on one computer, one was on the other. My setup in my office, it looks like I'm a broker on Wall Street right now. Because I've got like monitors all over because I can do this, but I can be doing this at the same time. It was very funny. I'm but, impressed. That makes me want to do two talks at the same time and see if I can wing it. <laughs> exactly. Question, answer, question. Question answer. Don't get your timing off. Yeah. But um, it's been really fun because you can connect, connect with so many people around the country that you may not have been able to meet already. Or they're saying, oh, look, let's go catch this talk with her as a book group or whatever. You're able to do that. And I find that as much as life has been restricting at this point, there is something really lovely about you're finished and you walk in the kitchen and have dinner. You walk, you're not, you don't have to get on the subway and go home. I'm really sorry I don't miss it, you know? Yeah. I mean, even like someone like Christina Baker Klein has a book coming out, The Exiles, which is fantastic. I read an early copy of it. And and I'm and normally I would have to make sure I was free the one night she was speaking in New York. Mm -hmm. But now she's doing a tour. I think it's like 14 different virtual stops. And so I can just pick whichever one works for me and, you know, show up, like you said, in my, you know, shorts and a T-shirt. Yeah. And watch. So, so for, for as a reader and an author, it's so convenient. And, and what a wide reach of, of audience. It's incredible. There's a lot going on right now. There's a lot out there right now. And I think that that's what people are looking for is um, how can I entertain myself in the evening? And I'm saying that this is a golden age for books because there's so much other that's not happening right now. They're just starting to shoot. Maybe you're going to shoot. They're not even sure what they're doing. But by the same token, you could have a book life completely because you can be writing and researching. The book can be being produced. It can be going into the bookstores and everything with us all being virtual. And I, well, you know, people that are in the stores and people who are in production are in a different place, but it's a lot of the um, intellectual property of it can happen behind the scenes, which can't really happen with any of the other entertainment mediums. Yeah, you're right. And it, it's working. People are reading and books are getting out and, um, you know, people are doing virtual, virtual meetings and book clubs and author talks. It's incredible. Yeah, we're actually asking people, you know, what have you done? And so many have pivoted to Zoom. So when you think about it, for an author right now who used to either call in or have to show up at an event, the fact that people are so comfortable with this technology that has four letters that we didn't even know about. I mean, back in February, if somebody said Zoom to you, you'd go Zoom, Zoom. You know, like, really, you had no idea. But right now, it's connecting people in so many different ways. Yeah. Oh, it's marvelous. So, so I mean, in, in a time of great crisis, it's incredible the way the publishing world has been able to pivot and, and do okay. Yeah, really, really, really. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure. I'm glad that we were able to connect across our dining rooms. I think yeah. we're in our dining rooms. <laughs> so it was lovely to see you. And I wish you so much luck with the new book, with this book, and with the one that you're working on. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for being there since from the very beginning. I, I can't tell you. It was five years ago, and I really appreciate it. Oh, so much fun. So much fun. And to our viewers and listeners, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for joining us.